All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, David Dorian. I'm one of the uh, cardiology residents. I'm in uh, C2 or PGY5. Um, and um, of course, it is echo round. So I'm going to talk about a, um, a syndrome that is most um, uh, notably characterized on um, echocardiogram. And I'll show lots of pictures um, and we'll talk a little bit about it. This was inspired by a recent case that uh, came through the CP CCU. So um, I'll go over the case presentation, which is something that I'll, I'll touch, touch on throughout the presentation. Uh, I'll keep coming back to it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology, the pathogenesis of this syndrome, um, how it tends to present clinically, and, and maybe how we might be able to distinguish it from other disease entities that present similarly. Of course, uh, the echo evaluation, and I'll show lots of pictures. I'll talk a little bit about the long-term prognosis, uh, and some, uh, we'll go over some management pearls as well. So uh, to start, um, I'd like to introduce this case of a 67-year-old woman who recently was admitted to the same like CCU with Takatsuo syndrome. Um, she's uh, 67, like I mentioned, uh, no known history of coronary disease. Um, and she presented with three days of central chest pressure, which was worse with exertion. She was up at her cottage and she noticed that she began to feel unwell, had some discomfort in her chest. This was worse with exertion. She had significant shortness of breath on exertion as well. She was previously healthy with no um, exercise limitations, quite healthy, um, and walking upstairs or even going on short walks left her breathless. Her chest discomfort on the third day got worse and that prompted her to visit a local emergency department. Uh, and when they heard her uh, clinical story, um, looked at the ECG, ultimately um, it was uh, decided that they should treat her as an acute coronary syndrome and she was given uh, doing antiplatelet therapy in heparin, and she was transferred that night to the hospital uh, So she came uh, directly to St. Mike's via helicopter um, for a plan to uh, send her to the cath lab in the morning. Um, when she arrived, she was stable, and her chest pressure, her chest discomfort at that time had begun to subside. Her vitals were within normal limits, with the exception of her blood pressure was just a little bit on the soft side, but um, nothing too dangerous. A systolic ejection murmur was heard um, um, on precordial uh, auscultation, um, and there were no clinical signs or features of heart failure with uh, clear lungs and no uh, distended jugular venous um, veins. Uh, and a troponin was drawn, of course, when she came in the door, and it was sort of moderately elevated at 534, um, which is elevated, but no, you know, not in keep keeping with a, a large you know, missed infarct from three days before, nothing like that. Uh, this was her ECG on arrival uh, to St. Mike's, not arrival to the initial hospital. Um, you can see that, um, you know, there are some, um, you know, pretty um, obvious uh, features here to say that there's abnormalities that might suggest um, a coronary ischemia. Um, there is a, some subtle ST elevations in V2 and V3, and there are these big deep T wave inversions the QT is also a little bit on the longer side, uh, maybe 450 or 450 to 500. Um, there are no ST depressions and there are no Q waves. I, well, I, on the description of the ECG from the from the initial hospital, there was a little bit more ST elevation of EGV3 with those T wave inversions, so that this was classified initially as Wellens syndrome. So of course she was taken to the cath lab um on the presumption that she had coronary disease on the basis of her presentation the troponin and that and that ecg this is the angiogram you can see that um uh, on a uh, view of her rca here it looks pretty clean there's no significant coronary disease um certainly no culprit there are no major abnormalities there um they moved over and uh shot her left system this is uh her led coming down there is maybe some disease in the proximal to mid segment of that LED, no focal stenosis. Looking at her circ here, um, nothing there. It's pretty smooth. It's a pretty wide open. So looking at her LED, you can see, again, that there is some disease in the proximal segment there. At the time, um, it was not really clear how significant that disease was and whether or not, not could whether or not that could be flow limiting and, and, and be sort of her uh, culprit lesion. Oh, sorry, I skipped the video. Um, you know, at this point, the, 
uh, fellows were salivating, they were high-fiving, and they were uh, cracking open their wires, but cooler heads prevailed, and uh, they decided to uh, pursue some more advanced intravascular imaging first. Uh, they put a wire down the LED and did OCT imaging to try to see if there was any evidence of acute plaque rupture, um, as opposed to just bystander coronary disease and something else being the cause of the presentation. Um, ultimately, on the OCT, there was no evidence of plaque rupture. There was no thrombus. Um, it was uh, there was some some uh, some plaque, but nothing that looked acute. There was no dissection plaque, and so they decided to leave it alone and do a left ventricular gram first. Um, and ultimately, that's what the, made the diagnosis on the cath, ta uh, cath lab table. You can see that there is apical ballooning and hyperkinesis of the base hyperkinesis of the basal segments of the heart and a, uh, a diagnosis of Takotsubo syndrome was made. So it's a good thing that they decided to do OCT and um, ventricular imaging first. So this was considered by a standard coronary disease and she was um, transferred back to the CCU um, stentless. This was her echo when she uh, got back to the CCU. I'm sorry, it shows green for a second there. There we go. Um, this is the apical four chamber view. Um, let me see if I can... I don't know if you can see. I'm trying to highlight. No, it doesn't work. Okay. Um, you can see that there's uh, hyperkinesis of the basal segments, uh, and there's uh, akinesis, almost even dyskinesis of the very apex. You can also see that um, the anterior mitral leaflet on the on the the left leaflet on the right hand side um, during systole moves towards the septum, moves anteriorly, kind of shifts. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more um, uh, later in the presentation. This is uh, also her initial echo. This is the three chamber view now. Again, um, a hyperdynamic base, um, and then moving in sort of hypokinetic towards the apex and the very tip of the apex is is almost is dyskinetic and kind of balloons out during systole. Again, when the aortic valve is open during systole, you can see that the anterior mitral leaflet moves, moves towards the septum, it kind of shifts, it's sucked into the LVOT. Again, we'll, we'll circle back to that. So, so what's going on? I'm going to let Dr. Cox explain, but I just like this video clip. As far as your patient is concerned, Takasubo cardiomyopathy. Ever heard of it? I haven't. Takasubo cardiomyopathy, also known as broken heart syndrome, is when a severe emotional trauma triggers a weakening of the heart muscle. On her chart, you indicated that she was single, yet I noticed she was still wearing her wedding ring that her husband had just died and she wasn't ready to take the ring off yet. I'm betting that her grief over his passing is what caused her heart failure. And no, no, I'm, I'm not Superman. I'm just Dr. Cox. Please look over. So we didn't make the diagnosis quite so cool, but I, I like that video clip. So, uh, so of course, Takotsubo syndrome um, is what we're going to talk about today. Um, it was first described in Japan and, and um, in the late 80s and early 90s. The word Takotsubo comes from the Japanese word for an octopus trap. So it's this pot um, that's used to trap octopus. I'm not exactly sure how it works. I thought octopus were supposed to be pretty smart. So I guess they get in, they get stuck. Um, I actually don't really know how it works. Um, but basically, in the syndrome is this um, characteristic apical ballooning um, uh, with basal hyperkinesis um, that is transient in nature. So it's a transient left ventricular dysfunction in response typically to an acute phys physical or emotional stressor. Uh, this is just a bit of a dig at Kim Connell. He likes to say, and I, I, I guess he's true, although I haven't actually vetted this, that he was one of the, the first people to describe a case series of patients with Takotsubo syndrome outside of, outside of Japan in the late 90s. Now, I'm not sure if that was the 1890s or the 1990s, um, but he likes to think that, uh, that he was one of the first. I, I, I believe him personally. So I just, I just want to make a, a brief, uh, no, uh, take a brief note on, on some of the terminology because this is uh, something that goes by a lot of different uh, terms. 
So I'm going to be using the term Takotsubo syndrome, which is the recommended term by the European um, uh, Heart Journal. Uh, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is also a frequently used term. The reason that they prefer syndrome over cardiomyopathy is because it is transient in nature or tends to be transient, whereas most cardiomyopathies are not, um, are not quite so transient. So, I, I, you know, I, depending on which article you read, it'll go, it'll go by different things, but that's just the, the term I'm going to use today. Stress-induced cardiomyopathy is also another um, frequently used term as well as apical ballooning syndrome, ha a broken heart syndrome, and happy heart syndrome, depending on the clinical context for which um, it um, arose. So uh, in terms of the epidemiology, um, Takotsubo syndrome is, is it's actually more frequently probably than we recognize. Um, it's estimated there are 15 to 30 cases per 100,000 per, 100, person years. So in a city like Toronto, that's hundreds, if not thousands of patients per year. Um, and there's probably a lot of subclinical cases that go unrecognized. People come to the hospital with, um, you know, said chest pain and other problems, and then in, uh, they don't get an echo and it gets missed, or maybe somebody with acute coronary syndrome with some bystander, you know, plaque, uh, and they get a stent and sent home. Uh, but really, it was Takotsubo syndrome. S situations like that, it might, it might get missed. Um, importantly, it actually counts for um, a good good portion of STEMIs, uh, given the volume of STEMIs that, that we see, um, and that's up to 5 to 6% in women and up to 1 to 2% of all comer ACS. It's unclear if there's ethnic differences. Um, originally, it was thought that it was more common um, in Eastern Asian populations because it was first described in Japan, um, but there's, it's not really clear that there's any difference. Um, at least none that's been very clearly described. In the U.S., it's maybe a little bit less common in African American and Hispanics. That being said, um, you know this is that's observational data, and and there's obviously a lot of there are a lot of confounders, um, and there are maybe other um, social reasons why it may go underdiagnosed in those populations. So uh, I'm not sure I, I really uh, believe that. Um, in terms of some of the risk factors and, and, the, and the typical patient who, who gets Takotsubo syndrome, so a majority of patients are over the age of 50, and a vast, vast majority, over 90%, are women. So this is primarily a disease of postmenopausal women. Um, why that is, it's not entirely clear. The, the presumption is that there's some sort of um, hormonal influence, um, but it's not entirely clear um, what that is. Um, there's a, a common uh, association with either psychiatric or neurological illness underlying uh, before uh, Takotsubo syndrome develops. Um, and pre-existing psychiatric disease is present in up to 43% of patients. Anxiety and depression, which are very common in the general population, are the most common underlying um, psychiatric um, diseases. Um, and neurologic diseases as well, like stroke or intracerebral hemorrhage, are also common, uh, in particular a presentation up to, up to a third of the time sometimes. Like I mentioned, one of the hallmarks of Takotsubo syndrome is that trigger, whether it's emotional or physical, and that's that it kind of follows the rule of thirds. So roughly, well, a little bit more than one third of the time, uh, there's a physical trigger involved, and that could be any physical trigger. Um, usually it's uh, people who are quite ill um, in, in the ICU on a ventilator, um, and in particular, um, uh, patients with um, neurologic involvement. I know personally, and I, I know some of the other residents, residents can attest to this, Takotsubo syndrome is actually seen not that infrequently at uh, Toronto Western Hospital, where they have a really busy um, a neurosurgical ICU. Um, on the other hand, it could be an emotional trigger, and that can be both positive or negative emotions. And there are countless different clinical scenarios uh, out there in the case reports, people who have you know, crashed their car or people who have done really well on it, you know, um, uh, an exam or, you know, who have lost a loved one or, you know, have been in a fight um, with a spouse or, um, you know, the, 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 basically the, the options are endless. But up, importantly, up to about a third of the time, there's no clear trigger. So sometimes people literally just develop it out of, out of the blue. Um, and it could be that there's no identified trigger. Um, that's clear, and that maybe there was something uh, that just wasn't picked up on history. Um, but at least um, um, on, uh, on reports, almost about a third of the time, there's no clear trigger. 
I just like want to take a second to go through some of the uh, the fun case reports that I found when I was doing some reading for Takotsubo syndrome. So for those of you who um, like to read medical journals coming from Bratislava, uh, this is a case of a woman who uh, had to really go had really had to go to the bathroom, but she couldn't find a bathroom. Um, so she was holding in her urine uh, and with a distended bladder and nowhere to go, she ended up developing, developing Takotsubo syndrome from having to pee. So uh, make sure there's always a washroom nearby. This is a case of a woman who had Zumba-induced Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, a particularly a strenuous Zumba class, um, is what triggered her, um, her Takotsubo in this case. Um, a new form of Takotsubo uh, you know, trigger was uh, in and around um, the uh, Trump era. So there's a, there, somebody coined the term impeachment cardiomyopathy. Uh, and I've also heard Trump cardiomyopathy for uh, the uh, emotional toll and that um, was uh, was felt <laughs> over uh, a couple of years. Um, and this is this is probably my favorite story. This is somebody who went to a wedding um, and they um, saw some green sauce or something. Uh, and uh, they thought it was uh, avocado, like guacamole. And so they took a big bite out of it, not realizing that it wasn't avocado, but it was actually wasabi. Um, and it was uh, it was spicy enough that uh, it broke their heart. So uh, careful when you're eating uh, careful when you're eating spicy food. Um, on on a population level, we can see that stressful world events or uh, situations where uh, on a population level, um, um, these kind of things might happen more often. They they actually do occur more often. So this is an example in Japan of um, uh, an earthquake in 2004. Um, and you can clearly see that there was a significant rise in the incidence of Takotsubo after the earthquake as opposed to before the earthquake. And of course, the earthquake was on October 23rd. So if you actually look you know, the, on, on the bar graph to the right, the in terms of the incidence of Takotsubo, before the earthquake was the first uh, 10 months of the year, and after the earthquake was the last two months of the year. So there's a very clear, sharp rise in the incidence of Takotsubo after this big, uh, stressful event. And I know what you're thinking. Well, we've had a stressful couple of years. You know, does the pandemic play into this? Well, it does. Um, there have been a number of case reports of people with COVID um, developing Takotsubo syndrome as a result of critical illness or even as a result of mild illness. Um, separate from actually physically having the virus or getting infected with, with the virus, the COVID pandemic has been associated with um, Takotsubo syndrome on a population level as well. This was a retrospective look at um, ACS pr presentation um, at two different hospitals in the US. And there was a, you can see that there was a steep uh, rise in the incidence of Takotsubo syndrome as the present, presenting cause for the ACS. Um, in, in the initial months of the pandemic. And this is over the, a two month period and they've compared it to two month period directly before that and, uh, and two month periods um, at the same time of year uh, in the preceding years. You can see that there's a sharp rise in the incidence of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy associated with COVID pandemic. So just, just to summarize, I, I, I have a short memory so I like to put in a couple summary slides. Uh, Takotsubo is actually relatively common. It's most common in, in, in postmenopausal women, especially between 65 and 80 or 85 years old. It, it accounts for 1 to 2% of all comers for acute coronary syndrome. Um, underlying psychiatric or neurological disease is a risk factor in, on almost half of patients, but it's not a requirement. Um, and the triggers follow the rule of thirds. That is, one third roughly have a physical trigger like a severe illness. Uh, one third have an emotional trigger, and one third um, there's no identifiable trigger. So we know that there's um, something that triggers this, uh, but how does uh, winning the lottery lead to apical ballooning of the left ventricle? That's the million dollar question, and the answer is we don't really know. We know that catecholamines are probably involved in some way, and there are a few different lines of evidence for this. So for starters, when patients present to the hospital with Takotsubo syndrome, you actually measure the level of catecholamines in their blood, they tend to be elevated. Uh, they actually tend to be very elevated. Um, in one particular um, study, they, they compared um, catecholamine levels in patients with 
um, STEMI and, and patients with uh, Takotsubo. And they found that patients with Takotsubo actually had higher levels of circulating catecholamines than those in Killip class three cardiogenic shock from a STEMI, um, which are very, very sick. Now this study, apparently they tried to reproduce it and they were unable to reproduce this. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, but there are other studies showing that, that at the very least, uh, patients with presenting to the hospital with Takotsubo syndrome do have very high circling levels of catecholamines. Um, in terms of the reverse, you know, what happens if you give catecholamines to somebody? Well, there are lots of case reports of people who have uh, either intentionally or inadvertently received epinephrine or dibutamine. Um, and they, they, these uh, drugs which we give have been shown to trigger Takotsubo. The same thing goes in an animal model as well. On the right, we see data from a rat model where they were given uh, both epinephrine or, or, sorry, epinephrine or norepinephrine. You can see in panel um, A that there is transient um, dysfunction of the apex. So below the horizontal line there is a drop in the um, um, con contract contractile force of the left ventricle. Um, and that happens at the apex in the mid left ventricle. But in panel C there, you can see that there's no um, loss of contraction at the base of the heart. Interestingly, you can see that um, norepinephrine does not seem to have the same effect as epinephrine. Um, so it may not be all catecholamines. Um, if you remember, um, the difference between epinephrine and norepinephrine is that epinephrine typically has more activity as a beta agonist. So um, what's, what's the link between catecholamines and their effect on the left ventricle? Um, there have been a few proposed mechanisms. So one being large artery coronary spasm. Um, also implicated is microvascular dysfunction. That is uh, whether there is a, a dysregulation um, of uh, coronary blood flow in the microvasculature. There may be a direct toxic effect of this, these large amounts of catecholamines in a surge on the cardiomyocytes. Um, and lastly, um, it, there, there is a hypothesis that the large levels of catecholamines actually trigger the, uh, they activate different cellular pathways that trigger the um, uh, myocardium to kind of go into a temporary sort of a hibernating state, sort of triggering a, a stunning. So why might, the, why, why the regionality? Why, why does this affect the apex um, and not the base of the heart in most cases? Well, it's possible that there's increased susceptibility, sensitivity to catecholamines at the apex of the heart that doesn't exist at the base of the heart. So in most mammalian hearts, there is a higher density of beta adrenergic receptors at the apex than there is at the base. There's a, there's a gradient from base to apex of increasing beta adrenergic receptors. And along with that, there is a inverse correlation with the um, native uh, sympathetic fiber innervation. So cells at the base of the heart have more sympathetic innervation and have fewer beta receptors. Uh, uh, myocytes at the apex of the heart have more beta receptors, but less innervation. So if there's a systemic flooding of catecholamines, it's possible that the apex of the heart is more sort of sensitive. It's more sensitized because they have less sympathetic innervation and there are more beta adrenergic receptors. So it's possible that that's what makes the apex of the heart more susceptible. Now, of course, this line of reading kind of falls apart when we look at other forms of Takotsubo syndrome that don't affect the apex and that affect other areas of the heart. So there's a little bit of a hole in this theory, but you know, for the vast majority of the pa of patients we see with the classic characteristics, this may be an explanation for why we see that pattern. Like I mentioned, there's the uh, there's one um, hypothesis that um, uh, large levels of circulating catecholamines can induce sort of a hibernating state of the myocardium that's sort of temporary, um, and and there exists a, a sort of molecular switch. So uh, when Catecholamines bind to G protein coupled receptors, which are their targets. There's a number of different pathways that can be activated within the cell. So there's the GS or the GI signaling pathways um, that have very different effects on the cell. The GS pathway is the um, 
uh, normal pathway, which activates adenylate cyclase and converts ATP to cyclic AMP, which has a number of downstream effectors leading to increased contractility. Now, the GI pathway has the exact opposite effect. It inhibits adenyl cyclase and it inhibits the production of a cyclic AMP from ATP, having the opposite effect. The thought is that there may be a sort of a protective mechanism behind this that switches the myocardium to, a, so, so to speak, a survival pathway that's anti-apoptotic and that reduces cellular metabolism. And interesting, there is some overlap with the signaling pathways that are seen in myocardial stunning that are temporary and sort of protective on the myocardium. Um, so how do patients with Takotsuba syndrome present? So they have some sort of stressful event that releases catecholamines, what do they experience? Um, you know, it's often an acute presentation, but it may be subacute as um, is the case in our presentation today. They frequently pre present with chest pain and shortness of breath. Um, syncope is another uh, presentation um, that, that we might see in particular those with LV outflow tract obstruction. They present very similar to somebody with your run of the mill ACS. Troponin is frequently elevated in up to 87% of the time, typically a mild or moderate rise. BNP is also elevated in 83% of patients, and they frequently have ECG abnormalities as well. Now, when they go to the cath lab, up to 15% of them will actually have bystander CAD as well. What specifically do we tend to see on the ECG when they come through the emergency room door? Um, SD elevation as opposed to SD depression is the predominant feature. So up to 44% of patients will have SD elevation on um, arrival to the hospital. Typically in V2 to V5, V1 is less frequently in, uh, effective. And in inferior ECG patterns, the inferior STEMI is, is rare. So ST elevations in, in leads 2, 3, and AVF is not typically seen. Like I mentioned, there's not usually ST depression. So we don't usually see the typical reciprocal ST depression. Um, and we uh, don't see Q waves in these patients generally. We do, however, see T wave inversions, um, and I'll show the initial, I'll show the ECG of our case uh, in a minute. How can we distinguish between uh, acute coronary syndrome and Takotsubo? Well, like I mentioned, ST elevation in V1 is less common in Takotsubo, and we don't see ST depression or ST elevation in the inferior leads. Um, there was one study looking at the um, uh, sort of a, a rule in, rule out rule for. Um, uh, ECG, and they actually use a, the lead negative AVR, uh, which is a positive 30 degrees. Um, and that elevation and, and negative AVR is much more common in uh, patients with uh, Takotsubo syndrome. But just like in acute coronary syndrome, there's an evolution. Typically, these patients come with ST elevation, and then they go on to develop these uh, deep T wave inversions, which can persist for days or even weeks. Uh, or in some cases, months. This is the ECG of um, our, our case. As you can see, the ST elevation has kind of subsided. Now it's given way to T wave inversion. So this suggests that maybe this um, ECG is more subacute um, as opposed to being taken with the initial onset of chest pain within the first couple hours, which is in keeping with the history of somebody who had chest pain for two or three days. Um, Notably, um, one of the features associated with um, a Takotsubo syndrome is QT prolongation with those deep inverted T waves. Um, it can be very pronounced over 500 milliseconds, and it does come with a risk of torsade de point. As I mentioned, um, Q waves are uncommon. They can occur, occur, but they typically resolve and there's reappearance of R waves. So, um, like I've alluded to many times, there are characteristic features on echocardiogram that, that sort of since uh, clinch the diagnosis of Takotsubo syndrome. That typical apical ballooning pattern is the most frequent pattern, which is prevalent in 75 to 80% of patients. Because there's a hyperdynamic base, this, these patients are also at risk of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And because there's akinesis or even dyskinesis of the apex, they are at risk of thrombus formation. Uh, the type two Takotsubo pattern um, is of mid ventricular dysfunction. That's the second most common in 10 to 20% of patients. So that looks very similar to the apical ballooning pattern, 
except there is still uh, movement and motion at the apex itself. Um, these patients are at higher risk of uh, severe left ventricular dysfunction. There's the basal or inverted pattern where, or reverse Takotsubo, um, where the apex is hyperdynamic and the base um, is hypokinetic or akinetic. These patients tend to have a less severe course. The last two uh, types that we sometimes see are much less common. They're quite rare. Um, and that's either with biventricular sort of uh, failure or um, uh, diffuse uh, global hypokinesis. These patients are typically quite sick and they're at risk, a much higher risk for hemodynamic compromise and cardiogenic shock. And then sometimes you can also see focal dysfunction where there's one particular segment or one particular wall that is affected. Um, these patients tend to have um, a, a more benign course. So let's look at some um, echocardiograms. Um, and hopefully these work. So on the left side of your screen, you can see that there's an apical four chamber view. In the middle, this is apical two chamber, and on the right-hand side, um, an apical three chamber view. You can see that the base of the heart is contracting well. There's good thickening of the myocardium, but as you move towards the apex, um, there's uh, hypokinesis or akinesis at the very tip of the apex. And if you look at the ventricle, um, and particularly um, at the end of systole, you can see that it has that characteristic um, uh, ballooning or Takotsubo-like shape. This is the case of an 83-year-old woman. Um, this is taken from St. Mike's, uh, who came to the hospital with sudden onset chest pain at a Blue Jays game. I don't know if that was uh, following a, a particular play. I don't know if they won or lost. Um, unfortunately, the, that, 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 the history wasn't taken. Um, this is somebody at St. Mike's in the neuro ICU after a spontaneous ICH. Again, you can see that uh, there is severe akinesis of the mid to distal apex, sorry, the mid, um, the mid ventricle um, extending out into the apex. Uh, you can see that on the parasternal long axis view and the apical four chamber view. And I've sort of highlighted that here. If you look what the arrows are, you can see that the, the, the myocardium is coming in. And if you look where I've sort of highlighted with the uh, red line there, there's very little movement at the apex. This is a case of a 62-year-old woman who uh, was under exceptional work stress at the time. So this is a similar pattern to those previous echocardiograms. Again, the base comes in quite nicely. In the middle of our screen here, we have the um, apical two-chamber view. You can see that um, the inferior and anterior wall at the base are coming in nightly and nicely. But as you go towards the mid-ventricle of the anterior and inferior wall, there is a loss of that contractile force. There's, there's no thickening of the myocardium. What's different in this case compared to the previous cases is there's now function of the apex. So the apex is working and the base is working, but there is a wall motion abnormality circumferentially in the mid ventricle. So this is the mid ventricular type of Takotsubo syndrome. I kind of highlighted that for you here. So where those lines are, you can see that the walls may come in a bit as they're being sort of dragged in, but there's no thickening of the myocardium. Here's another case of mid-ventricular Takotsubo syndrome. This is a 57-year-old woman who went to her daughter's uh, sports game. I don't know what the sport was. I don't really know what happened, but something happened that was exciting, presumably, and she developed a mid-ventricular Takotsubo syndrome. Again, you can see circumferentially uh, um, in the mid-ventricle, the, the myocardium is not thickening, um, but there is good function at the base and at the apex. So again, this is the mid-ventricular type of Takotsubo syndrome. Here's a case of the reverse type of Takotsubo syndrome. You can see that the base isn't functioning well here. If anything, it's a little bit dyskinetic, but the apex comes in. Now the overall left ventricular function of these echocardiograms um, is is down. It's, it's worse actually probably than some of the other ones we've seen. But we've also seen that there can be a variability in terms of their overall ejection fraction. In some cases, the overall ejection fraction is preserved, and in other cases, it's significantly reduced. So here, this is the reverse type of pattern. 
So how do we make the diagnosis? So there's, there's a number of different diagnostic criteria that can be used. Um, I'm gonna highlight two for you. Um, this is from the um, uh, European uh, Heart Journal. Um, and there's another from, sorry, this is from the American Heart Association. There's, there's, another, so there's another set of criteria from the, um, what's called the InterTAC, um, sort of task force on uh, Takotsubo syndrome, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, they're a little bit different. And to be honest, in reading the papers for these two different diagnostic criteria, it's not really clear how to use the diagnostic criteria. It's not like here's a set of criteria, you know, you have to have three out of seven, or you need a certain number of major or minor criteria. They basically just kind of list a number of different things that are associated with Takotsubo syndrome. But essentially, it's what I've already mentioned. These are transient wall motion abnormalities. They're usually preceded by a, a, a stressful trigger. They're usually um, not in keeping with the type of um, territories that would suggest a, um, um, a coronary event. Um, there is the absence on angiogram or other methods of um, a coronary disease or um, a culprit coronary lesion. It, it tends to come with a biomarker rise and um, ECG changes um and um there tends to be recovery of left ventricular function this is the intertac uh, criteria here they they uh, include a little bit more information on um the types of patients so normally more common women uh in particular those who are uh, post menopausal and they also highlight a little bit more clearly that there's typically an emotional or physical trigger um that uh, leads to this particular syndrome so I, I, you know, these, these set of criteria are helpful in that they uh, identify the types of people and, and the type of, uh, types of people who get Takotsubo syndrome and what the clinical picture tends to look like, but they don't function in the same way that other diagnostic criteria work in identifying a, a possible or a definite diagnosis um, or listing a set of criteria that you need to meet in order to make a diagnosis. They don't function in quite the same way. So like, like I mentioned, Takotsubo syndrome mimics um, acute coronary syndrome in terms of its presentation with biomarker rise, ECG changes, and acute onset chest pain. Coronary disease needs to be excluded. It is, it is more common in the general population, and the, the presentation is very similar. ST elevation and T-wave inversion are the most common ECG abnormalities. And we went through the five different subtypes on echocardiogram, with the April ballooning pattern being the most common occurring 80 to 85 percent of the time. The next two most common are the mid-ventricular type and then the reverse Takotsubo or the basal type. So what are the potential complications? We know that most of these patients tend to just kind of get better. Their symptoms resolve and their ventricular function returns to normal within a few weeks. But in the interim, they are at risk for a number of different complications. These complications tend to be, the risk of complications tends to be very upfront in the first couple of days, typically during hospitalization. And once patients are well enough to leave home, to go home, and they've been well for a few weeks, the risk of complications, late complications, is quite low. So there's the risk, of course, of acute heart failure, um, and uh, even uh, more se severely, but rare, is cardiogenic shock. Um, that can occur in cases where there is severe left ventricular dysfunction. And patients with the classic Takotsubo pattern with hyperdynamic, uh, with a hyperdynamic base, there is the risk of LV outflow tract obstruction. And secondary to that LVO outflow tract obstruction and systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, they can get secondary mitral regurgitation. Um, there's also the risk for arrhythmia and arrhythmic events. Um, atrial fibrillation is the most common but um, ventricular uh, tachyrhythmias and torsades de, torsades de point are also risks as well. Um, and, and importantly, these patients can be so sick that they develop cardiogenic shock and, and, and even die from the, um, this particular syndrome as well. Um, one thing I haven't met, I talked about very much is, but um, because the apex um, is uh, akinetic, these patients are also at risk for LV thrombus and systemic emboli or stroke. So this is our and this is our um, our first case again, and uh, this is the the 67 year old woman who was recently in the same ICU. Uh, 
this is a zoomed in view of um, her a an apical five chamber and the, the video is really choppy. I I'm not really sure why, I apologize. You can see that, that um, during systole, when the aortic valve opens, there is movement of the mitral valve apparatus towards the septum, even so much so that the anterior mitral leaflet touches the septum and causes an obstruction. This is systolic movement, uh, systolic anterior movement of the mitral valve or SAM, which is something that we commonly see in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You can see that's where the movement is right there where that arrow is. This is the uh, same view, but with um, color Doppler. You can see that there's aliasing um, and uh, ev evidence of turbulent flow through that left ventricular outflow tract. Also not really seen well here on this picture, and I, I wish I had a better one uh, that I didn't include in this presentation, but there's also secondary MR as well. There is a jet of eccentric MR that's pointed posteriorly as a result of the systolic anterior uh, movement of the mitral valve and some malcoaptation of the mitral valve leaflets. This happens in Takotsubo syndrome because of the um, uh, hyperdynamic nature of the base of the heart. Um, that flow acceleration through the left ventricular outflow tract um, leads to drag forces on the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, um, pulling it into the left ventricular outflow tract in addition to um, uh, a negative pressure that's created with that flow acceleration that sucks the valve in as well. This is the um, apical uh, three-chamber view with um, a continuous wave Doppler. You can see that there is a, a flow acceleration with a high velocity of flow late in systole with that classic dagger-shaped appearance of a dynamic LV outflow tract obstruction. It looks very similar to somebody who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is uh, through the apical five, uh, looking at pulse wave Doppler and the LVOT. This is during a Valsalva maneuver, and you can see that the Valsalva maneuver increases the gradients significantly. This was up to a peak gradient of almost 120 millimeters of mercury in this case. Uh, in terms of other complications, in addition to LV outflow tract obstruction, like I mentioned, there are rhythmic complications as well. Um, Takotsubo syndrome should be considered on the differential diagnosis for patients who have a, an abnormal ECG with really deep and wide symmetrical T wave inversion. Um, if you think of cerebral T waves, where these, these big bucket-like T waves um, through the V3 through V6, um, Takotsubo syndrome should be considered uh, high up on the differential diagnosis for that type of appearance. These are not necessarily benign um, ECG changes either, as these patients have a risk of developing uh, ventricular tachyarrhythmias. And now, um, interestingly, the degree to which there are T wave inversions and ECG abnormalities tends to correspond with the degree of myocardial edema, um, and that is the inciting trigger being a physical trigger. So, so it kind of speaks for itself. People who are sick to begin with and develop Takotsubo syndrome are at a greater risk of a, of a uh, major event. Those with an acute neurological or psychiatric disease are also at higher risk. The higher the troponin and the worse the left ventricular function are at higher risk. And for some reason, um, while it's the Takotsubo syndrome is less common in men, the risk for complications in men who develop Takotsubo syndrome appears to be higher. Like I've mentioned, uh, in most patients, the, the left ventricular function tends to improve and improves pretty quickly. You can see on the right here that there is already an improvement within the initial hospitalization that continues up to two months later. Um, like I mentioned, the majority of risk for complications is during the initial ho hospitalization and tends to subside. And then L as the LV and the ECG changes normalize. There is a recurrence risk for people who recover from Takotsubo syndrome, but it's actually relatively low. It's about 5%. In terms of what happens to these patients in the months to years after they develop the syndrome, there are some conflicting data. Some of the initial studies, population studies, reported that these patients had um, outcomes that were similar to um, uh, matched controls. 
um, with uh, a similar survival um, and similar risk for uh, major adverse cardiac events. But there is some more recent data that suggests that the rate of major adverse cardiac events and cerebrovascular events may actually be very similar to patients uh, who are admitted to hospital with acute coronary syndrome. With propensity matching, and there was a paper that came out in JAK a couple of years ago showed that the uh, long-term prognosis for patients admitted with Takotsubo syndrome looks very similar um, to those admitted with ACS in terms of the risk of stroke, the risk of uh, recurrent hospitalization, and the risk of death. So how do we treat these patients? While they're in hospital, um, I, I know this is kind of a, a bit of a cop-out, but the treatment is basically supportive. It really depends on what their phenotype looks like. For patients with LV outflow tract obstruction, we would treat these patients similarly to other patients with LV outflow tract obstruction uh, with cautious use of beta blockers, of course, being mindful if they're in cardiogenic shock or if they're in acute heart failure. If they're not in acute heart failure, we can be a little bit more liberal. IV fluids, again, if they're not volume overloaded. Uh, for patients who have long QT and who are at risk of arrhythmia, uh, beta blockers as well, or other antiarrhythmics. And for patients who are in cardiogenic shock, these are situations in where we might uh, uh, consider earlier the use of advanced mechanical support for two reasons. First of all, catecholamines and vasopressors may make the situation worse. And second of all, this because Takotsubo syndrome tends to be more temporary and it tends to resolve, advanced mechanical support may be a little bit more desirable if we know that it's, it's going to be more short-term. There's also the vasopressor levosimendin, which is a calcium um, sensitizer. It does not use, it's, it works by a different mechanism than catecholamines and it can, it can in, increase um, inotropy. Now, that being said, I have never really seen levosimendin being used in Canada or in any of the downtown hospitals in Toronto, so I'm not really sure if we have access to it, but it's a consideration. What about when they leave the hospital? There are no uh, randomized control trials, so there's only observational data. But contrary to popular belief and what you might think would make sense, you know, this is a disease of probably the disease of excess catecholines, it makes sense that giving these patients beta blockers would help them do better and reduce the risk of recurrence. But interestingly enough, there is no change in outcomes when you give these patients beta blockers uh, in terms of reducing the risk of death or their risk of recurrence. There's an equivalent risk of recurrence when you give patients beta blockers. Again, this is all observational data. On the other hand, ACE inhibitors seem to be a little bit or somewhat cardioprotective, uh, cardioprotective and that is there's a reduced risk of death. There's also a reduced risk of um, uh, recurrence of Takotsubo syndrome, uh, and ACE inhibitors may uh, promote, or sort of uh, not promote, uh, promote uh, recovery and um, reduce uh, the risk of um, long-term left ventricular dysfunction in the same way that it does in other forms of heart failure. For patients with uh, significant um, apical hypokinesis or akinesis who are, who are at risk of um, LV thrombus formation, there is no evidence for the use of prophylactic anticoagulation. But you know, according to expert opinion, it can be considered if uh, those wall motion abnormalities persist. Um, but that would be up to the discretion of, of the care provider. The back to our original case. She stayed in hospital for a couple of days for observation on the basis of her ECG changes, as well as her significant LV outflow tract obstruction with a high gradient, just for observation. She was given beta blockers, uh, and this is her echo after five days. You can see uh, her initial echo on the left and her repeat echo on the right. You can see that within five days already, there has been a significant improvement in her left ventricular function. Um, it's almost completely normalized, and there's that good contraction all the way out to the apex, and that's just within five days. This is uh, continuous wave Doppler um, through the uh, L, um, through the uh, LV outflow tract um, in this uh, same patient, um, and you can see that the great degree of obstruction that gradient has come way down. It's still there, but it's come way down. There's much less flow acceleration. So in summary, uh, just to wrap everything up, Takotsubo syndrome um, is not an uncommon clinical entity, in particular in postmenopausal women. 
and it's something that we should be aware of and look at for. Physical and emotional triggers, they can be anything, uh, but they're not required. Um, catecholamines are likely uh, involved in the pathogenesis of Takotsubo syndrome, but how exactly that works and the link between excess catecholamines and left ventricular dysfunction is not entirely clear. These patients present exactly like ACS with chest pain and ACG, ACG changes and troponin rise. The classical apical ballooning is the most common of the five subtypes of Takotsubo syndrome occurring in about 80% of the time, but there are other subtypes as well. The, this apical ballooning pattern can be complicated by LV outflow tract obstruction, arrhythmia, and shock, and that's something that we need to be aware of. But that risk tends to be uh, limited to hospitalization and tends to uh, rapidly decline over time. Most cases self-resolve with normalization of wall motionality within a few weeks, and the treatment, acutely at least, is largely supportive in fo focusing on complications. There is no evidence for the use of beta blockers uh, in, in, in being protective or preventing reoccurrence, which is a little bit counterintuitive. However, there is some uh, evidence, now again, observational evidence, that ACE inhibitors uh, may play a role in being cardioprotective and reducing the risk of recurrence. Uh, there's some things to keep in mind. Uh, and that's it. Thank you, David, uh, for such a very comprehensive review of Takotsubo and uh, uh, thank you. And um, um, just a quick question for me, uh, for any of these stressful events that you have come across, um, yeah. are they more likely to be happy events or unhappy events? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think the risk is about 50-50, but I think that there are more, typically it's, it's, it's uh, negative events are more often described, um, but I think the risk is, is relatively similar between the two. It's anything that would cause a surge in catecholamine. Yeah. From my perspective, I've seen patients who have won or lost at the casino who have come with Takotsubo, so it can go either way. Um, yeah. So, um, um, Kim, are you still on? So, the, so can you tell us about your, your series? Was that in the 1990s or 19 or, uh, or, or 20 uh, I, something? <laughs> yeah, I was in the in the late 90s, uh, Chiming. It took a few years to get published because no one would believe the syndrome. So, um, I actually wrote up with three right, cases when it first started. It, it was a lady who was uh, sexually abused at work. Her boss took her into a cupboard and said, uh, if that she didn't have sex with him, that she and she was a, a, a single mother, that she would be fired. And she came down in cardiogenic shock, actually, from a country hospital. Um, and she had the classic uh, form. The second was um, a, a couple that uh, it was in the Serbian Croatian war, and the, one of the neighbors was Serb, the other was Croatian. And the two men were fighting, and the um, partner of one of the, the Serbian uh, stepped in, and she became very emotionally distressed and presented to hospital. And the third was a pregnant mum who was uh, hit by a car. Um, she was in the car and someone uh, uh, um, crashed into the back of the car there. So I wrote it up and called it um, a little bit of a provocative title called Sex, Stress and the Broken Heart Syndrome. And uh, I actually submitted it to the New England Journal and I got a handwritten letter back saying, this adds nothing to the literature, um, which was a little bit harsh considering they published a lot of stuff on it subsequently. Um, and ultimately, we got it published in the Heart and the Beat today. So uh, there you go. Now, the path, the path to success. Never, never fear rejection. Um, exactly. So, any other comments or, or questions for David? Great job. Well, today we have the highest um, attendance ever, actually. Uh, it's close to 40 when it's the peak. So I just want to remind uh, people who have signed up for this um, uh, conference. Um, it's uh, free. I uh, just want to uh, help as many people as possible, in the, uh, both uh, within the academic community as well as the uh, uh, community as well, um, uh, because it's, we know that it's hard to actually have the rounds organized. Um, so we'll try to use this um, uh, a virtual platform to help uh, and disseminate as much information as possible. So once again, thanks, David. And uh, it's coming up to 9 o'clock, and uh, we'll uh, see you all again uh, virtually uh, next Thursday.